Today on America's Test Kitchen, we're staying home for brunch. Julie and Bridget unlock the secrets to perfect eggs benedict. Adam reveals his top pick for espresso machines. And Dan makes Julie a show-stopping German pancake. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. I can name four reasons, at the very least, that Eggs Benedict is a restaurant brunch favorite. You've got your creamy poached egg, your seared bacon, toasty bread, and it's all under a blanket of rich, buttery hollandaise. Mm -hmm. And those four reasons are also reasons you don't want to make it at home. True. Hollandaise can be tricky. Poaching eggs, very tricky. And if you're going to make it, you're making it for a crowd. And poaching eggs and hollandaise and making all that toast, that's a handful. Yeah, and you got to be super organized. Yes. So, which I'm not. <laughs> but we solved the problem. We made a foolproof hollandaise and a really great way to poach eggs and a way to do it all for a lot of people for breakfast. Sounds great. So we're going to start with the hollandaise, one of the trickiest of sauces. So hollandaise, like a mayonnaise, is an emulsion. And it starts with yolks, and this is four large egg yolks. Traditionally, you'd put this over a double boiler, and you'd whisk and whisk, and you'd pour in melted butter very slowly to make that emulsion. Some people do it in the blender. The blender, obviously, the blades run very fast, making it a little more foolproof. Sure. We found the best way is actually not to use melted butter at all, to use softened butter. This is already still in its emulsion, so the sauce doesn't break. Comes together like a dream. That was a stick of softened butter, and what's going to help us emulsify it is boiling water. Now, this water just came to a boil. I'm going to measure out a third of a cup, and this is going over the double boiler. I mean, this is a game changer. It's a huge, huge change in hollandaise. How many hollandaise do you think you've broken? Oh, a lot, actually. You know, in a lot of restaurants, I hate to say it, but their secret is using powdered hollandaise. Oh, and you can taste that. Yeah, you sure it's can. It's terrible. Now, usually, they just use a tablespoon or two of hot water. This is a whole third of a cup, so it's a bit more, but it makes a very light, fluffy hollandaise. So you can see there's chunks of butter in there. It's looking like it's not going to come together at all. Watch this magic. A Little bit of water, stir it up. That water starts to melt the butter nice and slowly so that butter doesn't come out of an emulsion. It just binds so nicely with the yolks. And of course, this is over a double boiler, so that water underneath isn't touching the bowl, and it's at a bare simmer. It's just gently cooking the sauce through. We're going to cook this until it registers 160 degrees, and it's nicely thickened. That takes about 7 to 10 minutes. All right. Well, Julia mentioned that the beauty of this hollandaise sauce, it's not going to break, which means it won't separate into water and oil as we heat it. The reason is that we use softened butter instead of the traditional melted butter. Softened butter maintains its emulsified structure. With melted butter, the emulsion has already been broken, so it has to be re-emulsified by whipping it vigorously, and it won't hold for very long. So use softened butter for an easy and unbreakable hollandaise sauce. We're going to cook this until it reaches 160 degrees, and it happens fast. Ooh, doesn't that look good and velvety? Nice and thick. So off the heat, this comes. Now, it needs a little flavoring at this point because it just has butter and egg yolks, which is pretty delicious. Yeah, I don't mind that. <laughs> We're going to add a little bit of lemon juice. This is two teaspoons of lemon juice, a little bit of cayenne, because that really brings the flavor out a long way. And I have to say, this version of hollandaise is so gentle that you can add all sorts of stuff to it. One of my favorite things is to add curry powder. Mm. It almost makes a curry hollandaise that's really oh, good yeah. for french fries or smoked paprika. We're going to leave it nice and simple this time, though. I'm going to season it with a little bit of salt. This is the kind of sauce that's so easy, you can just go crazy with it. And people are going to be so impressed. All right, so believe it or not, this hollandaise will hold perfectly well for several hours. So our hollandaise is resting comfortably, and it's time to poach some eggs. All right. Now, poaching eggs is pretty tricky when you think about it, because you're taking an egg, which cooks quickly and is fairly delicate. You're taking out its protective shell. You're dumping it into hot water. And the two things you want to cook perfectly, the whites and the yolk, cook at completely different rates. So it's tricky. It's a crapshoot. And there's lots of crazy methods out there. Of course, we tried them all. Cooking them in muffin tins in the oven totally didn't work. The ones on the outside cooked more quickly than the ones on the inside, and they didn't cook through evenly, so that was a bust. And another method that's popular on the internet is using your microwave with a little bit of water. Now, this sounds good. And after about 100 eggs, you might get the timing just perfectly for your own microwave. But if you tried another microwave, it's not going to work. So that was a non-starter for us. There 
there was one recipe that we found where you swirl the water into a pretty vortex that keeps the whites from spreading too much. Worked pretty well, but you could only do two eggs at a time. So if you're serving a crowd, it's not going to work too well. Very impractical. And then my favorite, which worked really well, is you take a spoon, two spoons actually, and you nestle the egg between them and you lower it gently in the water and you hold it there until the egg's cooked and then you raise it out. Egg was perfect, but it was kind of a hassle. And can you imagine doing that with 12 eggs? I that mean, kind of makes sense because you're adding the shell back to the egg. Yeah, pretty much. So what we found is pretty remarkable. It actually has to do with the egg. Now, first, you want to use the freshest eggs possible. And that's because there are two types of whites, because really, it's the whites that make a mess. There's the watery white that's on the outside, and then there's the thicker white. And the watery white, there's about 30 to 40% of the white is that watery white. And there's more of it as the egg gets older. So fresher eggs have less of that watery white. And so what we're doing now is I'm just putting these into a colander, and I'm letting that watery white drain away. But you can see the thicker white is staying behind. It's not going through the colander. So by getting rid of that watery bits, we're going to have less floaty bits in the water. And so you just want to crack the eggs into there and let them sit for about 20 to 30 seconds. Yeah, you can really see this thicker bit of the egg white right here, and the thinner part is draining away. Yeah, it's just sitting pretty. All right, now let's take a look at our water. So I have a Dutch oven here, and inside I have six cups of boiling water. Now, it's pretty common to add vinegar to your poaching liquid for eggs, and indeed, we're going to add a tablespoon of vinegar. A lot of recipes we found added a lot more vinegar because the vinegar lowers the pH, which helps the whites coagulate better, so there's less floody bits, but you can taste the vinegar after a mm -hmm. while. If you go much over a tablespoon, it's too much. We don't want pickled eggs. That's right, and I've tasted those from restaurants. It's kind of a bummer. Salt does a very similar thing, so we're going to add a teaspoon of table salt, but again, you add too much salt, you get salty eggs, but a combination of the vinegar and the salt does it perfectly and you don't get too much of one flavor. All right, so our water's ready. Let's come back to our eggs. Now you can see all that watery bit that's drained away. Now I'm gonna... Definitely, I mean, can you guys see all that white that's drained away? About an eighth of a cup of yeah. egg whites in there. Yeah, so it really did the trick. Mm -hmm. And those are the egg whites that would float around and make a total mess inside the pot. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. All right, so we're gonna leave those behind. Come back to our pot. Now I'm gonna turn the boiling water off and I'm gonna slowly add the eggs one at a time to different spots in the water. One. Slipping them in. Mm-hmm. So they have their own little area to cook. And you can see they're just resting gently on the bottom of the pot. All right, so we're gonna put the lid on and let's set a timer for three minutes and we'll be back. So it's been three minutes, time to look at our eggs. Oh, they look perfect. You can see those whites are just set and that's how you know they're done. Beautiful. Yeah. Now here is the best part of all. This is a holding pot for poached eggs. Now it registers 150 degrees and you can hold poached eggs in there for up to 15 to 20 minutes. I mean, look at that. That is just a beautiful poached egg. That is the perfect poached egg Isn't right that? there. And so this is how you cook eggs in batches for a crowd. Isn't that amazing? That's really cool. And this is kind of a restaurant technique. Yeah. All right, we're going to cover this to keep these guys warm. I'm going to scoop out any last wispy whites. There are always a few. I'm going to bring this water back to a boil so we can cook our second batch of eggs. And in the meantime, we've got to talk about toast. Trying to toast these one at a time in a toaster oven, that would take too long. By the time the last one's done, the first one's gonna be way cold. So these English muffins are going under the broiler for about four minutes until they're nice and toasty. Then put the Canadian bacon on top and it's just under the broiler for another minute longer. And breakfast is oh, served, my darling. Nothing better than that smell. Ugh, all right. Now, I'm just going to make us each a little half, because we'll come back to the rest later. Because we're dainty. <laughs> <laughs> and this holding water is just the best invention ever. I mean, it makes serving a poached egg on something like this so incredibly easy. So I'm just draining the excess water. Oh, look at that guy. Oh, he's quivering. He is perfect. Perfectly poached egg. A little of our hollandaise. The reason for living, I, I like to call it. I believe hollandaise is French for <laughs> sauce of life. <laughs> I'm going to definitely add a little black pepper to mine. The egg is, look at that, perfectly cooked. Yes. You never get that in a restaurant. It's crack open right oh. in that center. Mm -hmm. I want to shake the hand of the person said, you know what these mm -hmm. poached eggs need? Mm -hmm. An egg sauce. The flavors of the hollandaise, I mean, it's a very delicate flavor. But it tastes so good with the eggs mm. and the salty ham and the little bit of the English muffin. Mm. That hollandaise 
is beautifully buttery, isn't it? But it's still really light. And like you said, it's kind of a blank canvas. You could add a lot of different flavors to it. I have to say though, that little bit of lemon juice is kind of perfect. Yeah, and just that little bit of cayenne. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a good classic flavor. This is amazing, and you're right, it is perfect for serving with a bunch of friends. Mm -hmm. For foolproof eggs, Benedict, make sure to use softened butter for a make-ahead hollandaise. Drain eggs and then poach them off heat in hot but not boiling water. Top broiled bacon and English muffins with the eggs, pour on the sauce, and of course, eat it with a friend. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a perfectly executed home version of Eggs Benedict, also known as Eggs Benny. Hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Consumers pay an average of $2.70 for a single cup of plain old coffee, and a latte is going to run you around $3.78. So does buying an espresso machine for home use make some sense? Adam is here with the answer. How much espresso do you drink in here, <laughs> Bridget? You're going to have to drink a lot of shots of oh, espresso really? to make up the cost of one of these guys. Guess how much you can spend on a home espresso machine. Just guess. I don't know. $500. $8,000. That's more than I paid for my first car. <laughs> you and me both, several cars in, I still paid less True. than $8,000. We decided to cap the cost for our testing at $1,000. We have six machines, none of them cost more than $1,000. All of these except for one include some means of grinding. There's a grinder built in, so mm -hmm. you load them with whole beans. They also have different adjustments so that you can customize the brew change the grind size, change the temperature, change the volume according to your taste. They all have a way of foaming milk so that you can have foam milk for lattes and cappuccinos. Let's start with these three here. They all suffered from a similar problem, which is that depending on the kind of beans testers loaded into the hopper, not enough beans would drop down into the grinder. And so what would happen is they either had to open up the hopper, mm. push the beans down manually, or the espresso would get brewed with the beans that did drop down. And it wasn't really espresso, it was more like puddle water at that point. Not good at all. Not good at all for a thousand bucks, not acceptable. No. Moving on to that this money, machine. You totally wanted to make an espresso for me and tell me I'm pretty for a thousand bucks. <laughs> You're gorgeous. Have another espresso. <laughs> this is the Nespresso Latissima, and this is the one that uses these pods instead of whole coffee beans. It was really easy to use. It was neat. You can see that it has a more compact footprint than mm -hmm. the others. It was also the least expensive one in the lineup, about $375. Now, it made a beautiful crema, which is that sort of thick brown foam mm -hmm. at the top of the espresso. That's emulsified aromatic oils. Mm. It's supposed to be flavorful. Best part. Oh, it's wonderful. What was underneath the crema, the espresso itself, not as great. Really? Yeah, a lot of tasters sort of judge this to be a little bit thin, a little lacking in body and flavor. Now, they were willing to put up with a subpar espresso because it was so easy to use and because it was the least expensive mm. one. So if you're not that picky, right. this is actually something worth considering. It's the Nespresso Latissima. Okay. Let's move down to this guy here. This one is the Breville Barista Express. This requires a little more user interaction. You have to actually tamp down the coffee grounds into the port filter, position it, brew the coffee, empty the spent puck of coffee grounds out, rinse it, put it back in. You know, it sounds like a rigmarole, but it really wasn't that bad. It was easy to use, the manual was clear, and a lot of the testers kind of got into the routine. It mm -hmm. didn't take that long. And so for the DIY type, if you want to be involved in making your own espresso, if you want to learn a little bit about it, this one is not a bad one. It made okay. very good espresso. Great. Let's move down to this guy here. This is the Gaja Anima. This is the overall winner. This one was $690. I have an espresso for you to taste from this one. It was fully automatic. The espresso tasted great. It was simple to use, simple to see what was going on, mm. had easy adjustments. This is the one you want to bring home. That had a beautiful crema and really good coffee underneath. Well, there you go. If you'd like to be your own barista, then go out and buy the Gaja Anima automatic coffee machine, and it runs about $690. A German pancake, also known as a Dutch baby or a Bismarck, has very little in common with a traditional pancake. It's made without any baking powder or baking soda, but rather gets its lift and light airy texture from eggs, like a popover. And they're delicious, especially for breakfast. And today, Dan's going to show us how to make one. 
So Julia, this is the kind of recipe where the devil is definitely in the details. All right. Super easy to put together, but you really gotta pay attention to the ratios. So we're gonna start with our dry ingredients. I have one and three quarter cups of all purpose flour here. I'm gonna add in just a little bit of sugar. This is three tablespoons. It's kind of that sweet and savory combination, so it shouldn't be really, really sweet. So next we have a tablespoon of lemon zest. That's a lot of lemon zest. It's really gonna come through. It's gonna be nice and bright. We also have a half teaspoon of salt and an eighth of a teaspoon nutmeg. Mmm, lemon and nutmeg. Good combo. Right? It's a good one. So I'm just gonna whisk this up. We did a lot of testing looking at the wet ingredients. This is one and a half cups of milk. Then we have six large eggs. That's a lot of this eggs. This is a lot of eggs. So for a comparable amount of flour in other recipes, we found three eggs, four eggs. Six is a lot, but we really wanted this beautiful custardy texture on the bottom, and the eggs were key for that. We also have one and a half teaspoons of vanilla extract. So I'm just gonna whisk this up until it's nice and smooth, like a nice even color. Okay, that looks great. So now I'm gonna add this into the dry ingredients. We're gonna do it in two stages. We're gonna start by adding about two thirds of it. That's gonna allow us to really evenly mix it together and then we'll finish with the other third. A lot of times when we're making batters uh, for muffins, that sort of thing, we're very careful not to over mix them. We right. don't wanna to create too much gluten. What's nice about this is it's really a batter so it's thin enough that you don't get a lot of gluten formation. So it's not a problem. We want this to be really smooth. And adding a smaller amount of the liquid to start with is nice. You're able to kind of contact all of the flour more, and that way you can get rid of all the lumps before you add the rest. Okay, now the last third goes in. And just whisk until nice and smooth. Boy, very simple batter. Have I lost you at any point? <laughs> no, I think I got it. <laughs> yeah. Dry ingredients in one, wet in the other, mix them together. Exactly. That's why this is such a good brunch breakfast option comes together really fast. And not too hard for that early in the morning. Right, exactly. Not too much to think about. It's about all I can handle in the morning. Okay, so now we'll move over to our skillet here. So this is where our recipe really kind of goes down a different path than most of the ones we saw out there. So a lot of times you get your skillet as hot as possible. So you get it like ripping hot, pour in your batter, and then it goes into a really hot oven. And the idea there is that you get big puff and you get these gorgeous sides on it. Mm -hmm, like a popover. Like a popover. The problem is you don't have much of that nice custardy interior, and we love that. So we're actually gonna take a lower and much slower approach to it. So what I'm gonna do is heat this skillet, and I have three tablespoons of butter, I'm just gonna melt these three tablespoons of butter over medium-low heat, we'll pour in our batter, and then we're gonna go into a cold oven. Wow, very different than a traditional recipe. And what's really nice about that is it's much more gentle. So what we end up getting is a thicker bottom, very custardy, nice bottom, but the sides still creep up a lot. Yeah, it's kind of all about those sides, I have to say. And it's super dramatic, but you don't dry them out, so it's a really, really nice combo. Custardy with big sides. Yes. I like it. So the butter is melted, I'm gonna go in with our batter. And also, you're using a nonstick skillet. That's right. You can actually use a, a traditional skillet as well. We like using a nonstick as a little extra protection. This thing releases pretty well out of a traditional skillet as well. I'm going to take this and put it into a cold oven and immediately turn it to 375 degrees. About 30 to 35 minutes, it'll be done, and you're going to see the sides are going to grow really dramatically. So Julia, a lot of times you'll see apples actually in a German pancake batter itself. We tried a lot of those recipes and the flavor's nice, it's nice to have the pieces in there, but it really prevents a lot of spread. So you don't get the dramatic high sides, it just kind of gets in the way of the texture. So we decided to actually reserve the apples and make a topping. Very clever. So we get the apples, but we also get the right texture. So we're working with one and a quarter pounds of Braeburn apples. Braeburns are a really good baking apple, so they hold up, we're not gonna get applesauce, we'll have some nice pieces still. So I'm just gonna pop the core out. I'm just using this apple core here. I like it because it's got this cool eject feature. <laughs> you can pop it right out. So you're pro core. I like cores, yeah. Some people, it's a 50-50 shot with your pro or anti core. I like it. Usually when I'm working with apples, it's I'm working with a lot of them, right? And I'd just rather punch them all out. And so I'm gonna use my Y peeler, also a big Y peeler fan. And just wow. Think, you don't like a Y peeler? No, I actually, for me, I'm not a big core or a Y peeler fan. What? I like the old fashioned kind of peelers and when I peel an apple, I spiral it around to see if I can get the whole peel off without it breaking. <laughs> So I'm gonna start by cutting it in half. And we want half inch wedges that are then cut in half crosswise, so these nice little pieces like this. So to accomplish that, I like to cut first crosswise and then just cut my half inch wedges. So I have two tablespoons of butter melting over medium heat in our traditional skillet. That's kind of why it's nice to use your nonstick skillet for the pancake, we're gonna use this for the topping. Okay, so now that's melted, I'm gonna add a third of a cup of water a quarter cup of brown sugar. You have the makings for a caramel. It's looking good, right? So I also have a quarter of a teaspoon of ground cinnamon. 
and an eighth of a teaspoon salt. Now I just want to whisk this until it is dissolved, get that sugar dissolved. Now we're going to go in with cinnamon's best friend, the <laughs> apple. So this is not a very hot pan. We can really smell all that cinnamon and brown sugar. Well, what's nice about using brown sugar is it gives a lot of the same flavor of caramel, but very quickly, right? It's a lot more flavor than we'll get with white sugar. So I'm gonna bring this up to a simmer over medium high heat, and we're gonna cover and cook for five minutes. Let's put a cover on it. Put a lid on it. Okay, so this is five minutes, and we've got big transformation Oh, that smells here. good. Doesn't that smell awesome? It smells like the fall. It does. You can see we've got a lot of liquid that came out of the apples. We want that to reduce down and thicken up into a really nice glaze. So we're gonna cook this for about five to seven minutes until that sauce gets nice and thick and glazy, and the apples turn totally translucent and tender. Check out this reveal. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Every time I see it, I think it's even bigger than the last time. Isn't that incredible? It's amazing. This is dramatic. That is something else. I mean, it's just incredible. But I know it sinks kind of fast, too. Oh, there you can yep, watch it. Yep, it's starting to go down. Watch it as it goes. We have these beautiful tall sides. We've got this really thick custardy bottom. So I'm just going to transfer this over to a cutting board here. It's kind of the easiest way to go. I mean, this is just a killer thing to put on your table for brunch <laughs> or something like that. It is a showstopper. It's totally a showstopper. I'm going to cut you a nice wedge here. Look at that. Yeah, beautiful. Gorgeous. Would you like a little bit of apple oh, topping? Oh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. Okay. Get a little bit of that nice sauce on there, too. Don't hold back on the sauce. <laughs> well, now you can see that sort of custardy bottom. That was really important with the cold oven. Mm -hmm. How is it? Delicious. The edge is nice and dried out like a popover. I love how the apples aren't in it, because very often the apples release a lot of liquid and they mess with the texture. Having them on the side is a good idea. It's great, right? That nice egginess that you get, you're getting popovers here, it's the best. And it's easy. Mm -hmm. This is something else, Dan. To make an outstanding German pancake, begin with a loose batter using lots of milk and six whole eggs. Start it in a cold oven and bake until the edges are deep and golden and have puffed up dramatically. Serve with a brown sugar apple topping and you're golden. From our test kitchen to your kitchen, a fabulous recipe for German pancake. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and select episodes at our website, americastestkitchen.com. I might need another slice. I can make that happen for you. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.